right. So this afternoon we're going to study together the Gosho called Persecution by Sword and Staff. And I hope everyone has got the study material. Uh, this Gosho was written on the 20th of April, 1279. 20th of April, 1279. So Nichiren Daishonin was 58 years old at that time. Six months later, he achieved the whole purpose of his life, which was to inscribe the Daigo Honsen. This he did, as you know, on the 12th of October of the same year, 1279. And at that time, he'd been living in the deep recesses of Mount Minobu for about five years. And they were, really were deep recesses. Uh, he was, as he described it himself in other writings, in a deep, sheer, steep valley uh, or gorge, uh, at the bottom of which a stream ran, and it was intensely cold in the winter, and often very hot and full of mosquitoes in the summer. But as was the ancient custom for a wise man or a sage in those days, and a custom which had been the case in China and also in Japan, he retired uh, from, as it were, public life deep into those mountains because he had remonstrated with the ruling authorities of Japan three times and each time his words had gone unheeded. These remonstrations were made during the period between 1260 and 1274. So as I'm sure all of you know, his remonstrations were to the effect that because people and their rulers uh, had failed to recognize the ultimate truth of life and were still following teachings uh, which were unsuitable in accordance with Shakyamuni Buddha's own words for the, the age of Mapo, which had begun by that time. Uh, disasters were falling upon the country and the people were finding it impossible to attain any form of happiness. And he said that if this situation continued, these natural disasters would become worse and uh, the sufferings of the people would become greater and greater. In these remonstrations, he had brought things very much down to the reality of life at that time by pointing out that of the three calamities and seven disasters the Chakamuni Buddha had taught would occur to a country slandering the ultimate truth or the true law, two had not yet occurred. He said, therefore, that if the people continued and his remonstrations were unheeded, these two disasters that remained were bound to happen. The first of these was civil war, and the second was invasion by a foreign power. He said that these were, must occur in the near future. In fact, his predictions came true very quickly. Civil war broke out in Japan in 1272. And uh, in 1274, the Mongols invaded the southern island of Kyushu and again attacked this island of Kyushu in 1281. So Nichiren Daishonin uh, explained his dilemma over this particular situation. He didn't want the people to suffer from the hell of foreign invasion. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if it didn't occur, these calamities or disasters didn't occur, then they would slander the Lotus Sutra even more because uh, the truth of it did not actually occur. However, he prayed to save Japan from suffering because of these disasters. In fact, amazingly enough, both of these attacks by the Mongols in 1274 and 1281 were defeated not by the Japanese or by pitched battles, although some battles did, did take place, but they were defeated in both cases by typhoons, which uh, 
destroyed the fleets by which the Mongol soldiers had come to the mainland of Japan. So some of you were on, to uh, on Tozan in Japan a couple of weeks ago, uh, had the interesting experience of uh, seeing what was in fact the tail end of a typhoon. At least anyway, you're quite aware of the force of such a natural phenomenon. And you could easily imagine the disaster that it co can cause when it, it, it is at its, its full height. So anyway, despite these remonstrations and despite the predictions that Nichiren Daishonin made coming true, the Japanese people, and particularly the Japanese ruling authorities, still uh, continue to slander him and to slander and persecute his followers. Japan, in other words, didn't learn the lesson. And indeed, this persecution of the followers of Nichiren Daishonin continued down through the centuries until World War II, when the ultimate disaster of the atom, atom bomb took place in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. But the outcome of that was that a new constitution came into force in Japan, which freed religion for the first time in all history. So this is why Mr. Toda, the, the second president of the Soka Gakkai, called General MacArthur Bonten, Bonten being the name uh, of a Buddhist god or the name of one of the protective forces of the universe. So of course this didn't mean that Mr. Toda particularly revered General MacArthur, not at all. But General MacArthur was the instrument, or as we put it, the Shoten Zenjin, through which this protective force at last worked. And since those days, although there have been persecutions in Japan right up to the present day against the true teachings, uh, they are gradually abating in strength and power. Now this particular Gosho, Persecution by Sword and Staff, was written to Nanjo Tokimitsu. Nanjo Tokimitsu was the young lord of Ueno, a feudal lord, who was a faithful follower of Nichiren Daishonin. And in fact, uh, he ultimately gave to Nichiren Shoshu the land on which the head temple at Taishikiji now stands. So he was an extraordinarily important person. At the time this Gosha was written, he was still very young, but very active. His father had died, and he was therefore, uh, had succeeded to the title of Lord with all the responsibilities that that involved. In addition, he was strong in activities for, uh, in, in support of Nichiren Daishonin. And in, um, 30 Gosho were actually written to this remarkable young man. So, of course, we're extremely fortunate today that these Gosho uh, have been preserved, most of them in their original form, which is still at the head temple today. So we really have to thank those very early pioneers for the way they treasured the messages they received from Nichiren Daishonin so that we can learn from them today. The purpose of this particular Gosho was to uh, help Nanjo Tokomitsu and his other followers to understand the profound significance of the many persecutions which Nichiren Daishonin was suffering. This significance was, of course, that in undergoing these persecutions, in every detail, Nichiren Daishonin was fulfilling exactly the predictions made by Shakyamuni 2,000 years previously concerning the difficulties and persecutions which the votary of the Lotus Sutra in the age of Mapo, or latter day of the law, which started around 900 or 1000 AD, would have to undergo. So the fulfillment of these persecutions was validating the truth of Nichiren Daishonin's teachings in the orthodox flow of Buddhism down 2,000 years from the time of Shakyamuni. So in writing this Gosho to Nanjo Tokomitsu, it was this, as if he was saying to his followers, no matter what happens to me, no matter what happens to you, 
never doubt. All these sufferings are just proof that I am expounding the true teachings for this age. He's saying, despite all these persecutions, you must keep practicing, no matter what. Then, without a shadow of doubt, you will attain Buddhahood in this lifetime and live a life of no regrets. This is really what he's saying to his followers in this Gosha. So it may seem or look rather a long Gosha to tackle uh, in an afternoon, but somehow we must do it. I shall not go into the middle part in great detail since it's substantiating the first part, but we will tackle the first and the last parts uh, in detail this afternoon. But first of all, I think it's best that John reads through the entire Gosho. <clears throat> this is on page 299 of volume 2. Persecution by sword and staff. The greatest of all the persecutions which I have suffered were those at Komatsubara in Tojo and at Tatsunokuchi, where I was nearly beheaded. None of the others were direct attempts on my life. I have been reviled, denounced, exiled, falsely accused, and struck across the face. But these were all comparatively minor incidents. I, Nichiren, am the only person in Japan to be abused in both body and mind for practicing the Lotus Sutra. If anyone else has been slandered, as I have, it was not because of the Lotus Sutra. One incident I especially can never forget is how Shofubo, seized the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra and struck me across the face with it. His attack on me stemmed from the three poisons of greed, anger, and stupidity. Once in India, there was a jealous woman who hated her husband so much that she smashed everything in the house. Her excessive rage completely altered her appearance. Her eyes blazed like the sun and moon, and her mouth seemed to belch fire. She looked exactly like a blue or red demon. She seized the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra, which her husband had been reciting for some years, and trampled it savagely with both feet. Later she died and fell into hell, all of her except her feet. Though hell's guardians tried to force them down by beating them with iron staves, her feet remained outside of hell as a result of the relationship, albeit a reverse one, which they had formed with the Lotus Sutra by trampling on it. Shofubo struck me in the face with the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra because he hated me. Thus, he too has formed a reverse relationship with this sutra. One incident occurred in India, the other in Japan. One was perpetrated by a woman and the other by a man. In one, a pair of feet committed the violence and in, an, and in the other, a pair of hands. One happened because of jealousy, and the other because of the Lotus Sutra. However, the same fifth volume of the Sutra was involved in both instances. The woman's feet did not enter hell, so why should Shofubo's hands? The woman, however, hated only her husband and not the Lotus Sutra itself, whereas Shofubo hated both the Lotus Sutra and me, Nichiren. Therefore, his entire body will fall into hell, will enter hell. As the sutra states, after he dies, he will fall into the hell of incessant suffering. There is no mention of his hands being spared. How pitiful. Eventually, however, he will meet me again and be able to attain Buddhahood, just as the four kinds of arrogant people were ultimately saved by Bodhisattva Fukyo. The fifth volume contains the heart of the Lotus Sutra, for it reveals that the Dragon King's daughter attained Buddhahood without changing her dragon form. Devadatta represents the spiritual aspect of enlightenment, and the Dragon King's daughter the physical aspect. The principle of attaining Buddhahood in one's present form can be found nowhere else in Shakyamuni's teaching. The great teacher Dengyo enumerated ten outstanding principles in which the Lotus Sutra surpasses all others. One of them is attaining Buddhahood as a common mortal. This is the most important doctrine of the Tendai sect. 
and a section of the Hokke Mongu is entitled The Supreme Principle of Attaining Buddhahood as a Common Mortal. It is also a point of controversy between the Shingon and Tendai sects. The Dragon King's daughter attained enlightenment through the power of the Lotus Sutra. Bodhisattva Monju stated, I always proclaim and teach only the Lotus Sutra. The words only and always are the key to this quotation. However, the Bodai Shinron reads, the principle of attaining Buddhahood in one's present form is found only in the teachings of Shingon. Which only is correct? The Bo Bodai Shinron must be mistaken. The Muryogri Sutra states, in these more than 40 years, I have not yet revealed the truth. The Lotus Sutra reads, the world honored one has long expounded his doctrines and now must reveal the truth. <laughs> Taho Buddha affirmed that only the Lotus Sutra enables one to attain Buddhahood as a common mortal when he said, all that you, Shakyamuni Buddha, have expounded is the truth. No matter how repeatedly the believers in provisional doctrines may insist that one could attain enlightenment through the pre-Lotus Sutra teachings, it is as easy to refute their assertions as it is to smash a thousand pieces of earthenware with a single hammer. Tian Tai states, the practice of the Lotus Sutra is shakabuku, the refutation of the provisional doctrines. The Lotus Sutra indeed is the most profound and secret teaching. Ever since Jikaku, scholars of the Tendai sect have interpreted the passages of the Hokke Gengi, Hokke Mongu, and Makashikan in one way or another, and have given plausible explanations. Their views, however, are as useless to us now as last year's calendar or yesterday's meal. Even if someone should insist that, in the first 500 years of the latter day of the law, there exists a way to enlightenment apart from the Daimaku of the Lotus Sutra, you should not pursue it, even if it is based on the Buddha's teachings, and even less so if it is merely some scholar's opinion. The Devadatta chapter of the Lotus Sutra teaches that Devadatta was Shakyamuni Buddha's master in some past existence. He who was once the master is now the disciple, and he who is now the disciple was formerly the master. On pondering this chapter, I, Nichiren, realized that it reveals the profound meaning of the Lotus Sutra through the principle of the oneness of past and present and the inseparability of the one who teaches and the one who learns. Therefore, the merciful Shakyamuni Buddha became the master of the wicked Devadatta and the wise Monju became the master of the ignorant daughter of the Dragon King. Certainly, I, Nichiren, can in no way be inferior to Monju or to Shakyamuni Buddha. The men of Japan like David Data, and the women are like the Dragon King's daughter. Whether by following it or opposing it, they shall attain enlightenment through the Lotus Sutra. This is the message of the David Data chapter. Next, we come to the Kanji chapter. Only I, Nichiren, have read with my entire being the 20 line verse from this chapter, which a vast multitude of bodhisattvas proclaimed in a single voice. Since the Buddha's death, who else in the three countries of India, China, and Japan has ever read this verse as I have? No one even claims to have done so, nor do I believe that anyone has. The Kanji chapter states, there will be many ignorant people who will attack us with swords and staves. Perhaps others have been beaten with staves, but I have never heard of any who were injured by the sword. We know that Bodhisattva Fukyo was attacked with staves, in accordance with the words of the sutra, they would beat him with sticks and staves and stone him with rocks and tiles. But he was not persecuted by the sword. Tiantai, Miaolo, Dengo and others also escaped persecution by sword and staff in accordance with the words, swords and staves will not touch him. I, Nichiren, however, have been attacked by both. As I mentioned before, I was attacked by the sword of Komatsubara in Tojo and later at Tatsunokuchi. No one else has been thus assaulted for the sake of the Lotus Sutra, even once. But I, Nichiren, have been so assaulted twice. As for being attacked with staves, I have already been struck in the face by Shofubo 
with the scroll of the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra. Strangely enough, it is precisely that volume which carries the prediction that the votaries of the Lotus Sutra will be attacked with staves. Shofubo hit me before dozens of people, and though I knew it was for the sake of the Lotus Sutra, being human, I felt miserable and ashamed. Had I had the strength, I would have wrested the weapon from his hand and trampled it to pieces, except that it was in fact the scroll of the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra. This brings to mind a story. A father, anxious about his son's future, thrashed the boy with a bow made of boxwood because he refused to study. At the time, the son resented his father's action and hated the boxwood bow. However, he applied himself to his studies, disciplined his mind, and eventually achieved a great self-awakening, which also benefit, benefited others. In retrospect, he saw that he owed his achievements to his father's thrashings. It is said that in gratitude he erected a stupa made of boxwood to honor his father's memory. It is the same with me, Nichiren. When I attain Buddhahood, how will I be able to forget my obligation to Shofubo? Much less can I forget the thanks I owe to the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra with which he struck me. When I think of this, I cannot restrain my tears of gratitude. The Yujutsu chapter also explains something about me. Because it states that Bodhisattva Jogyo and others will appear in the latter day of the law to propagate the five characters of Namyoho Rengekyo. I, Nichiren, have appeared earlier than anyone else. How reassuring to think that I will surely be praised by Bodhisattvas equal in number to the sands of 60,000 Ganges rivers. Be that as it may, commit yourself to the Lotus Sutra and have faith in its teachings. You must not only believe in them yourself, but also encourage others to do the same, so that you may save your deceased parents and ancestors. From the time that I was born until today, I, Nichiren, have never known a moment's ease. I have thought only of propagating the Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra. I do not know how long I or anyone else may live, but without fail, I will be with you at the time of your death and guide you from this life to the next. All the Buddhas of the past, present and future attain enlightenment between the hours of the ox and the tiger. In all three countries of India, China and Japan, the place of Buddhist practice is located to the northeast in the direction of the demon gate. These are secret teachings of Buddhism which are reverently transferred from master to disciple. I will explain more, I will explain in more detail later, with my deep respect. As you crave food when hungry, seek water when thirsty, long to see a lover, beg for medicine when ill, or as a beautiful woman desires powder and rouge, so should you put your faith in the Lotus Sutra. If you do not, you will regret it later. Nichiren, 20th day of the fourth month, in the second year of Koan, 1279. Thank you very much, John. That was really a great reading. So we'll go back now to the very first paragraph. Could you read it again? The greatest of all the persecutions which I have suffered were those at Komatsubara in Tojo and at Tatsunakuchi, where I was nearly beheaded. None of the others were direct attempts on my life. I have been reviled, denounced, exiled, falsely accused and struck across the face, but these were all comparatively minor incidents. I, Nichiren, am the only person in Japan to be abused in both body and mind for practicing the Lotus Sutra. If anyone else has been slandered as I have, it was not because of the Lotus Sutra. One incident I especially can never forget is how Shofubo seized the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra and struck me across the face with it. His anger on me, his attack on me, stemmed from the three poisons of greed, anger and stupidity. Thank you very much. In the 13th chapter of Shakyamuni Buddha's Lotus Sutra, it states, there will be many ignorant people who will attack us with swords and staves. So this very first part of the Gosho is to do with attack by the sword. And you'll appreciate the importance, uh, the specific importance of this matter. 
because it fulfilled exactly those predictions of Shakyamuni Buddha. And of course, uh, this chapter where it said there will be many ignorant people who will attack us with swords and staves is specifically referring to the votaries of the Lotus Sutra. And the votary of the Lotus Sutra in the age of Mapo, in which Nichiren Daishonin was born and in which we now all live. There are, there are records of some of Shakyamuni Buddha's 24 successors after he died being beaten with staves and with stones. But there is no record of anyone who taught the Lotus Sutra in all history being attacked by the sword except for Nichiren Daishonin. And it happened, as he says here, twice, fulfilling those predictions. The first time was at Komatsubara. So if you've seen uh, a samurai movie, or if you saw the television uh, film of the book called The Shogun, you could quite easily begin to imagine what the persecution at Komatsubara was like. It took place on the 11th of November, 1264. Nijin Daishonin had been back to his own village where he was born to see his mother who was desperately ill. And in another Gosho, he records how, through his appealing to all the Buddhist gods, through chanting the Daimoku, his mother's life was extended by four years. After this stay with his mother, he was returning to Kamakura, the seat of the government of Japan. And on that journey, he intended spending a night at the house of one of his followers, a man called Kudo Yoshitaka, uh, on the way. It was just uh, dusk. They were not too far away from this house where he was to shelter for the night when uh, he was ambushed by uh, a band of samurai warriors under the command of a feudal lord called Tojo Kagenobu. Uh, Tojo Kaginobu was in fact the very same feudal lord who had uh, wished to kill Nichiren Daishonin immediately after he declared nam myoho renge for the very first time uh, back in 1253. And you remember in the, that time Nichiren Daishonin was able to escape through the help of some of his fellow priests. This time, however, uh, they were ambushed and the ten followers who were with Nichiren Daishonin had to really fight for their lives to protect Nichiren Daishonin's life. In the process, two of the followers were killed, in one of them being uh, his host for the night, uh, Kudo Yoshitaka. Nichiren Daishonin himself uh, suffered a sword cut on the head, and also his hand was broken. But fortunately, in the accounts of that particular battle, uh, the sword was somehow deflected so that it didn't actually penetrate his skull deeply. But most of you have seen in movies or in museums what a samurai sword was like. Uh, and you can well understand uh, that Nichiren Daishonin was really fortunate in truly being protected uh, by nam myoho renge -kyo. So it is said, in fact, that Nichiren Daishonin raised the hands in which he all the hand in which he always carried his prayer beads. He raised it up to protect his head as the sword was coming down, and hence his hand was smashed, uh, as well as the cut in his head. The second uh, incident with the sword was, of course, at Tatsunokuchi. On the 12th of September, 1271, he had been arrested by Heino Simon, who was the deputy chief of what we would now call the secret police. And uh, they took him to the beach of Tatsunokuchi, which was the place of beheadings with the intent of executing him. This attempt failed. Uh, as you know uh, from the story of Tatsunokuchi, uh, Nichiren Daishonin, his life was uh, saved through 
a natural phenomenon, uh, a thing which is difficult for us to understand even today, but an incredible light caused by a comet uh, flashed across the sky and so terrified the superstitious soldiers, including the, execu the executioner, uh, that they couldn't proceed with the execution. You can read all about this, if you wish, in volume one of the Gosho, uh, in the Gosho called On the Buddha's Behavior. So, of course, in both these cases, at Komatsubara and at Tatsunokuchi, the future of Kosunrufu really hung by a narrow thread. The future happiness of the human race through the power of the Gohongsun, nearly was destroyed. Of course, subsequently, after Nichiren Daishonin's life, later in history, there were also such periods, particularly when uh, the lay leaders were all imprisoned uh, at the beginning of World War II. But it was a near thing, and we must be thankful to those stout followers who saved Nichiren Daishonin's life in that battle of Komatsubara. So this represents the persecution uh, or the natural resistance of the negative force of life against the spread of the true law. In other Gosho's, Nichiren Daishonin said in many occasions, this is proof of the truth of my teachings. The fact that the negative and destructive resistance against this movement was so incredibly strong. Uh, it is known as uh, persecution by the three powerful enemies. The three powerful enemies being uh, lay people of great influence in society who, uh, for one reason or another, slander and ridicule or persecute the teacher of the true law, or secondly, priests who are ignorant yet think they know better about life and start a movement against the movement for Kosen Rufu. Or thirdly, stirred up by priest, the government of the day uh, turns itself against the movement for Kosen Rufu. So these are the three powerful enemies which have appeared from time to time over more than 700 years since Nichiren Daishonin passed away. So, of course, for ourselves individually, we experience what we call Sanchoshima. On an individual basis, and even uh, on a group basis, for instance, a district can easily experience Sanchoshima. But when it comes to an attack on the very existence of Kosunrufu itself, in a country, then it certainly would take the form of the three powerful enemies. So in a way, the three powerful enemies are like giant Sanshoshima. Right, John. So we'll read on now. <clears throat> Once in India, there was a jealous woman who hated her husband so much that she smashed everything in the house. Her excessive rage completely altered her appearance. Her eyes blazed like the sun and moon, and her mouth seemed to belch fire. She looked exactly like a blue or red demon. She seized the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra, which her husband had been reciting for some years, and trampled it savagely with both feet. Later she died and fell into hell, all of her except her feet. Though Help's guardians tried to force them down by beating them with iron staves, her feet remained outside of hell as a result of the relationship albeit a reverse one, which they had formed with the Lotus Sutra by trampling on it. Shofubo struck me in the face with the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra because he hated me. Thus, he too has formed a reverse relationship with this sutra. One incident occurred in India, the other in Japan. One was perpetrated by a woman and the other by a man. In one, a pair of feet committed the violence and in the other, a pair of hands. One happened because of jealousy, and the other because of the Lotus Sutra. However, the same fifth volume of the Sutra was involved in both instances. The woman's feet did not enter hell, so why should Shofubo's hands? 
The woman, however, hated only her husband and not the Lotus Sutra itself, whereas Shofubo hated both the Lotus Sutra and me, Nichiren. Therefore, his entire body will enter hell. And as the Sutra states, after he dies, he will fall into the hell of incessant suffering. There is no mention of his hands being spared. How pitiful. Eventually, however, he will meet me again and be able to attain Buddhahood, just as the four kinds of arrogant people were ultimately saved by Bodhisattva Fukuya. Thank you. These two paragraphs are very, very important because uh, they explain or introduce us first to this principle called the reverse relationship. And I'll come to that in a moment. First of all, I want to make it clear, of course, that this paragraph is also explaining the effect uh, on people of slandering the true law. In this case, he's having referred to the sword in the first paragraph, he refers to staves, and he recounts how he was struck by this man, Shofubu, uh, with the scroll of the Lotus Sutra. This would be a very painful thing, because in those days, the sutras were written on enormous lengths of sheets of paper that might have run from one side of this room to the other. And these were then wound round a staff, a pole. And it was with this instrument uh, that, amazingly enough, this Shofubo chose to strike Nichiren Daishonin with. So Shofubo uh, had at one time been a follower of Nichiren Daishonin. He turned against him, presumably because of jealousy or envy or some such reason. We don't know exactly why. And uh, he was titan, no longer practicing. And he actively turned against Nichiren Daishonin and no doubt told many stories about him because when Heino Simon, the deputy chief of the secret police, went to arrest Nichiren Daishonin to take him to that beach at Tatsunokuchi, Shofubo went with Heino Simon, and it was on that occasion that he struck Nichiren Daishonin in the way described in this Gosha. It's extraordinary, of course, isn't it, that it was the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra that was round, wound around this pole. The fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra contains chapters 12 to 15, and it's in chapter 13 that the prediction is made by Shakyamuni Buddha that the voter of the Lotus, of the Lotus Sutra in the age of Mappo will be attacked with staves. So, as you heard when John read the Gosha first time, Nichiren Daishonin describes this instant a little more, a little later on. So I think we'll read that again now. Uh, if you look, if you've got the paper like this at page two, line five, sorry, no, at page two, at the bottom, the last paragraph of page two. And in your Gosha book, it's line five of page 304. Starting with the words, as I mentioned before. As I mentioned before, I was attacked by the sword at Komatsubara in Tojo and later at Tatsunokuchi. No one else has been thus assaulted for the sake of the Lotus Sutra, even once. But I, Nichiren, have been so assaulted twice. As for being attacked with staves, I have already been struck in the face by Shofubo with the scroll of the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra. Strangely enough, it is precisely that volume which carries the prediction that the votaries of the Lotus Sutra will be attacked with staves. Shofubo hit me before dozens of people, and, though I knew it was for the sake of the Lotus Sutra, being human, I felt miserable and ashamed. Had I had the strength, I would have wrested the weapon from his hand and trampled it to pieces, except that it was, in fact, the scroll of the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra. So what a very human person he was, wasn't he? This is so encouraging for us. In that moment when he was struck, he really had to struggle with his anger and his shame at not being able to do anything back to the person who'd hit him. But fortunately, his Buddha state reminded him that it was the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra wound around this pole. And, of course, he didn't want to commit slander himself in using the weapon back against the man or in trampling it to pieces. So uh, he, at the same time, uh, remembered 
that indeed this was an incredible benefit in the midst of his pain and his shame because again he was fulfilling the predictions of Shakyamuni Buddha concerning the votary of the Lotus Sutra in this age. He was proving once again that everything that he was doing was right and correct and exactly in accordance with the orthodox teachings that went back 2,000 years. So his momentary shame and anger changed quickly to gratitude. And this, of course, in itself is the action of nam myoho renge kyo in our lives. We repress nothing. We transform what is destructive or negative into something positive. His, his immediate anger was transformed into gratitude and his passion for continuing to teach wherever he went. Let's go on uh, for another two paragraphs after that. This brings to mind a story. This brings to mind a story. A father, anxious about his son's future, thrashed the boy with a bow made of boxwood because he refused to study. At the time, the son resented his father's action and hated the boxwood bow. However, he applied himself to his studies, disciplined his mind, and eventually achieved a great self-awakening, which also benefited others. In retrospect, he saw that he owed his achievements to his father's thrashings. It is said that in gratitude he erected a stupa made of boxwood to honor his father's memory. It is the same with me, Nichiren. When I attain Buddhahood, how will I be able to forget my obligation to Shofubo? Much less can I forget the thanks I owe to the fifth volume of the Lotus Sutra with which he struck me. When I think of this, I cannot restrain my tears of gratitude. And Nichiren Daishonin is really pointing out here that on the path to Buddhahood, we are bound to experience opposition, obstacles, difficulties, and sufferings. This is inevitable if we are really challenging and transforming our lives into something that is advancing forward steadily and positively and creating value. Always the negative side of life will rise up to try to defeat us. So these times, of course, are both testing times and also times when we are expiating karma. We are expiating past slander that we've committed either in this lifetime or in previous lifetimes. So in, in a sense, therefore, the battle we have with such difficulties are a process of purification which ultimately leads to Buddhahood. In the letter to Sado, from Sado, Nichiren Daishonin wrote this, Iron, when heated in the flames and pounded, becomes a fine sword. Wise men and saints are tested by abuse. My present exile is not because of any crime. It is solely so that I may expiate in this lifetime my past heavy slanders and be freed from the three evil paths in the next. So sometimes we also may feel we're being uh, heated and then pounded with a hammer. I know I have at various times in my life. But the point is, one must never give in. This is the testing time. This is the time of purification, the expiation of uh, unhappy or bad effects from the bad causes and slander we've created in the past. So we must go on. And indeed, this is one of the great uh, uh, responsibilities and purposes of our organization called NSUK cause us to go on, no matter what opposition we may encounter. This is also the reason for the much wider global organization called Soka Gakkai International.